hey, Carolyn and Scott. <laughs> Again, what a friendly chat before I actually get questions. Hello, welcome to First Friday's Conversations with Archivists, produced by the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives, which is part of the University Libraries at UNC Greensboro. My name is Stacey Cram, and I'm sitting in for Beth Ann Kelch. Today, I'm speaking with Lacey Wilson, public historian of the Albany African American History Project, as she discusses her work with the oral history project, Women Politicians in Their Own Words, which was a university libraries project funded through the UNCG She Can, We Can initiative celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. Thank you for speaking with me today, Lacey. Not a problem. Thank, good to see everyone again and good to see you and happy to be back. Great. So to begin, um, can you talk a little bit about your connection to UNCG and how you started with the project? Yeah. I had gone to UNCG's museum studies program, and as I was figuring out housing and all of those kinds of things, it was strongly suggested that I apply to be an oral historian um, for the 125th anniversary project. Um, and that ended up being my student job while I was in graduate school. I worked under Scott primarily, and it was really great. We did over a hundred interviews. I don't remember the exact number, Scott may throw it in the chat, but we did a lot of interviews with students and teachers and alumni and professors. And it was really in depth and exciting to be able to do that. I had done some oral histories in the past as undergrad. And so it was great to do that professionally for UNCG. And then I was looking for work in 2021 and had reached out through Erin, I think specifically first. And she had told me that there, there's this opportunity coming up while well, um, part, part-time um, contract based. And I was happy to um, apply and come back and work in the collections again. It was always a great time. Yeah, so can you give us a bit of context about what the Women Politicians Oral History Project is about? Yes. Yeah, so um, the way I remember it is that we um, the she can he, um, the she can, we can she can we can grant um, is um, allowed us to um, allowed for a lot of programming related to um, women's suffrage in particular. And what I was doing was reaching out to local women politicians, primarily within the triad. But I was I started in Greensboro and expanded outward, talking to them about their journey in politics, their um, and how they they've been in these political positions. Um, and just really discussing the depths of what the um, what it meant to be a part in these positions and doing this kind of work. Um, I would say that's primarily it. So I did research individually on some of these people, but I had a base level of questions and I was happy to just see where the conversations took us. So um, you spent a lot of time with these politicians. Can you talk a little bit about how these women um, entered into politics? What some trends were that you noticed? Uh, I think a lot of, I think there were a couple of categories, I would say. I think there were several women who were like career politicians, that this is something they always wanted to be involved in. They, they, they were something they were like, they had like studied politics or some kind of governmental thing in schools related to that and then became lawyers and went into law and then found and then moved toward politics very intentionally. But I think for a lot of, of the people I interviewed, at, at least half, maybe a little less, somewhere between a half and a third, there were a lot of women who just, there became this moment in time in politics where something happened either nationally or locally and they decided they needed to get involved in a bigger way beforehand. Like they all, I think, had a reasonable understanding about politics as well as what it took to be involved and try to, and what and the importance of their own vote. But I think for some women, they were they, this was always like a journey for them. They were started on initially, but I think for a lot of women, there was like a specific thing that happened either locally or nationally. They're like, I need to be more involved than I am. I've been doing grassroots work. I have been doing nonprofit work. I've been a lawyer for these particular things, but this specific thing that happened. Um, we, I need to, I need to actually take, be, um, run for office and start that journey. So I, I think that's really interesting that it was something in specifically that the, that these politicians felt that 
wasn't being dealt with in the community that they were the, going to be the ones to fix it. Um, did these women talk about what uh, the climate was like when they entered the political arena? Yes, because I think a lot of them, I, I very much focus on in, what, what was it like for like your first running for these jobs? So like, what did it look like as you're like really stepping into the arena this way? Um, so they talked about these, all of, almost all of these were like local politicians. So they talked about what it was like to try and to like canvas and trying to get involved in various political parties and those machines and what that looked like and where they got support and where they didn't. They talked about how um, some people had um, various interactions with people they were running against and how that, not camaraderie, but that competition, how that would either be more competitive or less competitive and what it was it like to interact with voters. It was really interesting the different ways that that climate looks like and how it came about. Like they talked about canvassing and, and what those individual like conversations with voters are like and the particular hot button issues that came up in those conversations as well as in debates and raising of money and just how different it is. It seems to me that it's a very like nuanced and complicated thing to run for office in a local space that is like Greensboro is so very like, I would say it's open and closed at the same time. Like there's a lot of ways you can communicate with a lot of different voters and with these political systems, but there's also a lot of doors that get closed and you have to be able to figure out exactly how to get past those doors and what ways to get around and just like th those those various things. It's a very complicated climate, I would say. Um, but there were a lot of we talked we talked about stories about people um, about what was it like to just be to be in these spaces and how there, there were there were, I think for some of these women there was shock at the amount of doors that could be closed as well as surprise that once they had gotten perhaps after their first term the doors that they could then open for other people at the same time and there there's a the the push and pull of what's it like to be in that position at that point. Did the, the women you interviewed talk about any differences that they felt they were experiencing as politicians being women that they weren't seeing happening with them? Yeah, I think we got, uh, we, we talked often a lot because there were quite a few of them who were mothers at the time that they were running and how people were concerned about, um, there, there were a lot of comments about how can you do it all? And that whole conversation, which if you're not familiar, is a relatively common conversation with a lot of professional women who have children or are thinking about having children. I think they, um, they, there's a real interest in, um, from people about like, well, if you're doing this, are you really being a good wife or good mother? And like the other jobs that they held for this, because when it came to like Greensboro um, County commissioners, as well as like city council, those are not full-time jobs. So they often are doing other things at the same time that this is like going on, which is interesting. Like um, they were a com um, they they talked a lot about how they would dress a very particular way and notice how they their male counterparts, people men who were running, were not always getting commentary or questions about the what they were dressing or how they were appearing, as well as just the kind of microaggressions with like specific terms about being very serious, not being friendly enough, and. Think things like I think that a lot of professional women go through in terms of these microaggressions, just very specifically to politics as well. Um, but at this, even going back to the mother thing, what I found very interesting about like that play is they would then also be very invested in involving their kids if they were old enough in the process, like bringing your kid to canvassing and really talking about the um, relationship you then have with you and your kids in schools and how that would potentially be more inviting to a lot of people. It's really, there, there, there seemed to be quite a bit of, there, there, for a lot of women that I interviewed, there was like a real awareness about the differences that they could notice as well as then they, um, and then being in that position, like then holding the seat, um, and then recognizing when there are less women in particular rooms or not as well, that I don't know if their male counterparts always noticed, because again, I was interviewing the women. Um, and so I would, off, um, there were a couple, I don't remember specifically who off the top of my head, but there, but I had a question where there was like a particular group, I think it was county commissioners or city council, I don't remember which one. But one of them was like majority women. There were like two men in those positions, but majority of women. And I, each time I interviewed someone from that, I asked if they had noticed. And some of them did. And some of them were like very proud of this fact. And then some of them 
talked about how they still work just as well with the men or the women. And at the same time, I don't think the men, had I interviewed them, would I don't know how they would have responded to that question. But what well, the women all seem to not, all seem to be at least aware of it, even though they answer differently. You interviewed um, politicians that were a wide age range. So some of them were just entering politics mm -hmm. and some had are veteran, were veterans. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, were there, were there any differences you noticed between those stories? Yeah, I went to Kay Cashin's house to interview her, um, which was a fantastic interview. It was one of the video ones that I did, though I think they all were video, but um, it was one of the um, it was one of the ones where I had to like bring a camera. So I remember it relatively vividly from that. Before the interview started, we walked around her house for a little bit, and she's like a career Democrat politician. So I saw her pictures with both the Clintons. I saw a picture of her, I believe, with Obama when he was stumping down here. And just the, the institutional knowledge that she had. Like, I wanna say, I don't remember, check the playlist that's in the chat now. There was, that was a long interview. We talked a lot for about a, a long time about a variety of things and the many positions she had and things that she'd seen. And then I wanna compare that. I may, I may have misremembered her name, Mary Beth, who was like new in county commissioners, I believe. Um, it was like, she had like just, she had um, not only had she just run and won, she had like just recently, they had like done a recount for her. So we just, just like really recently finished that when I interviewed her. And what was great about interviewing her is she was a history teacher before. So she was very like cognizant about like the way we were talking about this in relation and comparison to the history of women's suffrage in particular and very like self-reflective on her own journey in terms of that. But you can really, but it was just the difference in like the kinds of questions I would ask her and the things that she was concerned about. Like Kay Cashin had like so much institutional knowledge about Greensboro and Guilford County in North Carolina, frankly, while Mary Beth was really just thinking about like her specific experience in terms of being a teacher, being in these spaces and in um, conversations with PTA and issues she was excited to be involved with and the limited portion, the small portion that she had had already, as well as like the things that she was coming. Like there, there was still mo so much enthusiasm from the both of them in terms of the work ahead, but like the, the difference in the amount of time was already so evident because like me and Mary Beth got really into like the self-reflection that she was really dealing with I'm um, thinking about at that time while Kay Cashin was like recounting these like very specific notable stories that had like big names in them. Like when Bill Clinton came down stumping for Hillary, like that's not a conversation I was gonna get from Mary Beth, but Mary Beth was also very reflective about like what made her want to run what conversation she was in, excited to be involved in and things that she specifically wanted to change. It was a very interesting dichotomy. I want to say Kay Cashin was like third or fourth. Mary Beth may be one of my last ones that I had done. Mm -hmm. um, did these women ever talk about the importance of having mentors? Yes, yes, they did. Um, they Quite a lot about like um, the different kinds of mentors that they had. Um, both in college and as they were um, in their business, the work that they were doing before they went into this space, as well as political mentors. It seemed clear to me when I've talked to Mary Beth, because I now don't remember the other county commissioner, I think Carly Cook, who I wasn't able to actually interview, but Mary Beth talked about talking with Carly Cook um, when they both were in, once they both were sworn in and the conversations that they had at that space, being able to, as, as like newly joined um, in that, those kinds of spaces, as well as like the conversation they then had with Kay Cash and, and like in being involved in these spaces. It seems very evident to me that mentorship was very crucial for having these women recognize that they could be in these leadership spaces and making these kinds of decisions, as well as what are great, um, great opportunities for collaboration across these spaces as well, both like because like getting into politics seems like such a specific weird thing. Like you um, to, to like be deciding that they can like make these decisions, but also there's specific things the city um, council can do as opposed to the county, as opposed to like the mayor and just like those very specific lines. So learning about that, I think um, from other people in those spaces, that kind of mentorship seems very clear to me because there doesn't always seem to be a clear orientation that happens. Like they're, they're either, I think you, 
I don't remember uh, definitely what they said, but I think you have to like really seek those kinds of things out and talk to the right people in order to really be successful, being able to like cross those lines and make those collaborations happen. Right. And were there any particular stories that you recall that really stood out for you? Um, there were, this was last year, um, there were a lot of, it, I think what was really interesting to me um, were a lot of the, uh, one of the, my favorite questions to ask um, when I was interviewing this woman that I think I definitely asked everyone was like, where uh, do you remember your first vote? And what do you remember talking about your mother with politics? Because it was like, that was like toward the end of the interview, but it really made them reflect on the purpose of these interviews, which is like reflecting on suffrage in particular. And what's interesting is the couple of women who had not talked to their mothers about politics ever or remembered their mother's first vote and how that worked out in particular. Um, I want to say uh, Rep uh, Council Member Thurman, I've now misremembered her name, but um, I think she grew up in the same area of Maryland that I did. Um, she grew up in Silver Spring, um, but her parents were born in DC. So when I had asked her about her mother being able to vote, she's like, well, we couldn't until the 70s because of the way that D.C. specific voting laws were occurring, which I didn't know. I didn't know that like you couldn't vote for your representatives in D.C. up until a certain point because because that was not something that was taught to me. That was not something my parents or grandparents, despite their time in D.C., had actually told me. So it was really interesting to like learn that very specific thing about like they couldn't until like a very specific year in the 70s, they could actually vote. Um, it was interesting the way that mothers did or did not talk about politics, as well as um, there were the, the ones that I also remember even going back to the mother thing about the involvement of always taking their kids to vote as well, which is a memory that I have that I don't think is unusual of be going with your parents to vote and what that looked like. And the, um, when he asked people about their first vote, they remember it so specifically, um, especially reflecting on now being able to vote for themselves sometimes, which is, is really interesting. I think those are the stories that stand out to me now coming up on, a, frankly, an election day next week. <laughs> um, did any of the women talk about what they thought were important characteristics as leaders? And did there was there a trend in what you saw with that? I think collaboration is something I would think of when I think about like, not even just like the more established ones like Kay, but like when we even think about like Mary Beth and being able to like put together an organization or group of people to help you run. You want to have people who will work well together and be very honest in those conversations and try to put you in the right spaces to have conversations with voters and organizations and put you in front of very specific social media and that kind of thing. I think that's collaboration would be key. I think the openness of that, uh, being able to like talk with mentors in particular. And I think, um, there was in a clear, I think something I think that is really, I don't think is unique to Greensboro, but I think is very specific to places like Greensboro that have a very heavy college age population. They, there's a real trend that I noticed in those conversations of the people I was interviewing being like, it, it's hard to convince students that they need to vote in local elections. They, students are very interested in national issues, but when you think about the things that are actually affecting them in terms of the county or the city that they live in, it's hard to convince students that that's something they should be studied up on or involved in. And so it's really interesting to sort of like see that get put together in conversation and how what that looks like. Um, I'd say collaboration, I would say um, in, in terms of just trying to like be involved with these conversations. And it's, there, there's, the, the real like pride of the places that they're representing, I think is another trend that I've seen. Because I, again, most of them I taught, most of my interviews were like um, Greensboro, Guilford County. I did a interview in Kernersville with the mayor and I interviewed a representative in Winston-Salem as well. And both of those were areas that I didn't know as much about because I lived in Greensboro at the time, but it was interesting to learn about local history through them and through their enthusiasm of being in these spaces. and. Um, being able to do this kind of work. So I would say pride, collaboration, and specific to Greensboro at the time, interesting dynamics with getting students to vote. 
Yeah, another dynamic I'm thinking of, as, as you may be aware, we have a certain uh, certain history in Greensboro focused on, on race. <laughs> and uh, you did interview uh, women from a variety of backgrounds, but some were representing historically African-American districts mm -hmm. or, and those were the constituents they were speaking to. Um, do you recall anything brought up in those conversations you'd like to talk about? Um, I'm going to try to find the name of the woman I think that was really interesting that I got to talk to because she unfortunately passed away like around the time that I was leaving. It was Carolyn Coleman. That's right. Carolyn yeah. Coleman. I did relatively good research on her, but I don't know how much that I, the thing that came up in that conversation um, when I talked to her was her work in civil rights in Savannah, Georgia like very explicitly. I don't, I don't think that's something I necessarily knew that much about, at least not clearly before we talked. So it was really exciting to be able to like get those conversations out. I think something I definitely said when I came back after interviewing was like, someone needs to do a more thorough interview with her about just like her whole life. And unfortunately, I don't think we were able to get it, but she definitely had just come from like a meeting either earlier that day or earlier in the week in terms of just like representing her district and had like stuff that she truly wanted to get off her chest in that interview. Um, so feel free to go forever, go and listen to that one in particular, because there were like things that she mentioned to me before we interviewed. And I'm like, do you want that on the record? And I think she did in terms of just like complications that she was having with those in particular and what that looks like. Um, with the the um trying to like be involved with these very specific African American communities as well, but also let's we can even think about Nancy Vaughn, who I think was was she real um she was about to the, there was an election that year for mm -hmm. her I think I think she was like running and what what that looks like and it was 2021 so she was still very conscious of like things that were happening related to race and politics in 2020 that were very clear that some of that got brought up and some that didn't just by the nature of like trying to have questions and have a conversation. And that was very interesting as well, just being able to see what it looks like from like a mayor's point of view, a city that has, a, has two HBCUs in it, has like a very clear civil rights history as well, just seeing what a, that space even looks like from there, which is very interesting. Um, Th those are the those are the, like bits that stick out to me as well. But it was interesting. I'm, I've pulled up like the list now. I would say most of the people I talked to were not black, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is something that I think came up naturally in those interviews with the ones who were. And by far, I don't think is this. I don't. I don't know exactly how representative that is over when we think about like the populations of the places I was talking about. Yeah, I think I recall you telling me that the city council was extremely diverse compared to the county seats. Yeah. Um, did you notice any differences between um, how mayors and county commissioners, commissioners and city council talked about politics? Yeah, I think um, I think what's interesting because mayors were essentially work those positions kind of worked as like an executive position. Um, I mean, it was different to interview someone from current the mayor of Kernersville versus Greensboro because those are slightly different in terms of the way those areas are set out, um, as well as just thinking about like the length of time that um, Don Morgan, mayor of Kernersville, held that position. She was the first woman to be elected mayor of Kernersville and had been in that position for quite a long time. So she talked very knowledgeably about like the institutional history of Kernersville and how it sits and um, the opportunities of bringing businesses there. Like they, and I, I didn't, wasn't able to interview anyone else in Kernersville. I don't, um, so that was like my main Kernersville like moment of record as well. But the way she was talking about like this larger history of what I was considering to be a very small town, not a city, Greensboro was like over there, is it was really interesting to me the way she was like describing these very specific, um, these very like specific things so loftily. I, I, th I think it's really interesting the way she would just talk about, the way she was talking about like laws and things that were coming up and things she was doing and things that she has done. And then if I were to compare that to the way that county commissioners and Greensboro City Council would talk about very specific organizations and city 
bodies that they had to like be involved with to get very specific things done. Just like the nature of those jobs is so different. Like mayors are representatives of these areas in addition to being like executives here. So the amount of power that they wield is so different from like a county commissioner and city council member who has to like really work and organize within those groups, as well as be um, listen to their, their constituents on a much smaller scale. So I think there's an opportunity to know specifically more about like what your district knows and cares about if you're putting in the effort to do so, as opposed to like a full city or a full small town where you're, you, there's, only, there's, there's a lot of work you have to do, but there's also a lot more power you have to lead and a lot of other representative things that you have to be involved in. Um, it's really interesting the way that those shifts happen and the way those conversations go. Um, and I think I would also say that the mayors that I interviewed were also much more careful with like the things that they were saying to me. Like it was still a good conversation, but I think you can see in the interviews the way that they process information and what they decide to tell me was probably a little bit different than the way that county commissioners and city council members were ready to divulge information on a much, I would say more readily scale. Though they all got questions ahead of time, they all got the opportunity to do or don't use these kinds of things. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'd encourage people in uh, chat to ask questions. Um, first question um, or first comment, I would think people who were long retired versus people who were actively serving or running for re-election would respond very differently. And you did have, that was kind of the better and new person dynamic. I think so. I don't think anyone I talked to, though, I think everyone I talked to was interested in running again at, at, at a coming up point. Like some people were like actively in election or had just finished a race. But I think everyone I talked to was probably interested in running again. Um, no one immediately said, no, this is going to be, this is gonna be my, my posterity for like the end of my political life. I think everyone was like interested in continuing on in those spaces. I, I now kind of wish I'd asked that question more directly, but I don't know if they definitely would have answered that, mm -hmm. how they would have answered that. So go ahead and put questions in chat if you have any. Um, were there any particular aspects of the interviews that really stood out for you? Um, I think it's really, I think there were a lot of, I think it was, it's interesting to get women to reflect on their professional jobs that have been so public. Like there's a certain amount of information that I can do research on ahead of time before these interviews, as well as talking to them before the actual interview about things specifically they are they definitely want to talk about or definitely don't. But it's really interesting to have them reflect in real time about specific things. Um, I also think it's really interesting to like put like a microscope on local politics as well. Like, I don't know how much I knew about it before I like really started this job and really had the opportunity to look into it. Like I was actively listening in, listening in on like city council member like meetings sometimes in collections just to like be aware of anything coming up. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, I think it was like, this was the first oral history project I did where, main, where majority of my interviews were on Zoom. So I wasn't sure how that was going to work out, but everyone was very open and excited about being a part of it. Like, I think there, there was a real excitement to be like put in posterity in UNCG's collections, which I think um, they really, most of them really saw as like the honor that it was. A couple of members were very, were alumni of UNCG. So they were excited to be a part of that in that sense. Um, and I think they were, I, I, I think, I, I think that's a lot of it. I'm excited to, yeah, it was really interesting to see. No, I'll, I'll go back. There was, uh, I asked a lot of them because a lot of them are older about like what role social media played. And I got a lot of interesting answers about that of some of them being like, oh, I don't really use it very much. I only use it in very specific ways or my campaign manager or someone else handles that. Um, but for the people who had been involved a long time when social media really became a thing, it was interesting to see the way that they looked at it and the way that they, used it or didn't use it um like as someone who grew up with social media and then someone who would grew up in politics in it i was really interested to see whether there was a real difference if there was like a really really hard lines or boundaries that came up and it seemed like there were some but they mostly saw it as the tool that it was to use which was an interesting perspective 
Um, for our final question, did anyone go kind of the opposite route and have like a really low budget grassroots campaign where they put up flyers? There were there were a lot of there were a lot of flyers. I would say there was a lot of low budget. There were um, with county commissioners in particular, probably Mary Beth. I think there's like a real um, there was like a real insistence and in, interest in like doing a lot of the work herself. Like she was going to school meetings, she was going to PTA, she was going door to door. I think a lot of that is pretty crucial, and I think that came up a lot even just like in the earlier races of a lot of the more established ones as well. Like when you decide you're going to be involved in this, I don't know if a lot of them had immediate like funds that they could just like dive into for spaces like this, which is interesting. Just being able to like see how these things came up and what they would choose to spend money on and what they would choose not to. Um, I remember a lot of conversations about like, um, oh, what I'm trying to remember now. It was, um, I think it wasn't Kay. It was one of the first interviews I did. I think it was Mary Kay, who was a restaurant owner. So she um, got very involved. She'd like been watching county and city council member meetings just at her restaurant. And so got further involved, I think, with the restaurant community. And that's how she was able to make a lot of connections in terms of getting a lot of her message out there as well. It's really cool. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I really appreciate the effort you put into this project. Oh, you're welcome. I really enjoyed doing it. It was really interested to have these conversations and learn so much about these very specific local stories and everyone get out and vote. <laughs> oh, and, and just before we leave, Shelby put in, <laughs> Shelby has been, uh, has been indexing these, these oh. old histories, so she has listened to them. <laughs> Do, do you know if Carolyn or any other women you interviewed talked more about views and relationships with the younger gen and their political involvement? How did you feel while hearing it? Um, I definitely, I'm sure there were moments where I felt like particularly defensive for younger generations. Like as someone who's like paid attention to politics a good portion of my life and um, was really interested. But I think there were a lot of, there was a lot of like concern that younger generations, particularly in Greensboro, were like not doing anything in terms of like local politics. Like they would grassroots show up to council meetings, angry about stuff, but would not like show show up regularly. Yes, Patrick wish for snappers for sure. There, there, I think there's like a real, I think there's like a real sense that like college students very care a lot about national politics, but don't care very much about like local stuff, which I don't, I, I, I hate to paint with a broad brush, but when you're like working with that kind of when you're in a kind of position, I think there's like a tendency to do that. Um, I think that there was a lot of, uh, I, I, I think for, because um, I think that Nancy um, Vaughn was also probably as hesitant to speak a lot about like specific um, smaller gener local and younger generations as well. Um, I don't know if that came up in those interviews. Feel free to correct me on that. I think for people who had, were newly involved in politics, I think they probably were more interested to see younger generations as a benefit as opposed to like a threat. But Carolyn spilled quite a bit of tea in that interview. I remember that. I think that was the last interview that I did. And it was so fantastic to like hear so much from it and like really hear like the portions coming out of that. Like I, I might listen to it again because like I thought it was like really fascinating to just like get all of the in-depth thoughts that she was getting. Like, that's why I was like, guys, you need to interview her again. And again, I'm very sad that we weren't able to. You may have been the last person to interview her. I think I may have. I feel like Aaron like messaged me and was just like, did you interview her? Cause she just passed away. Um, go and listen to those interviews, which I believe are just like fully on our YouTube, like the playlist mm -hmm. in the chat. Go listen to Carolyn's in particular. Like I think she hers was like really interesting and really in depth with like things that she was actively thinking at the time. Um, in terms of that, I think that was probably one of the favorite ones that I did. Um, I, I was also really, really glad to talk to her. She was like very welcoming and excited and wanted to hear about stuff from me, which I, as an interviewer, am like less excited about talking particularly about myself. I'm not the reason we're talking right now. You're the reason we're talking right now. Um, but she was like very welcoming and excited to be a part of things. And so that was fantastic. I, I, I'm trying, I'm struggling to remember anyone else specifically who specifically mentioned younger generations. Like I feel like count, there were county commissioners and city council members who were like wary about social media and things and just like 
but I, th this could be a bias of myself, but if there was a particular politician who was like wary about social media, but specifically mentioned Facebook, I don't know if the younger generation is on Facebook nearly as much. I think we've all retreated to other portions of social media. That could be me and my bias in the circles that I'm in. But I think that in terms of like learning about things on social media, I was very, so I was really interested in, in we talking about social media as well. Like, well, what other social medias are you on? Is it just Facebook? There were a couple of people who had like Twitters, but it was primarily just regurgitating things that were coming back onto Facebook. And it was, it was interesting the differences as well as like the way that they saw these constituents as well. It was, it was really interesting. I, yeah. MySpace back in the day, absolutely. Um, I don't think anyone specifically mentioned MySpace, but I kind of now wish I had asked. Yeah, so thank you so much. Everyone go and check out that uh, link I put in chat with those oral histories. Um, and thank you so much for speaking with us today, Lacey. Oh, no problem. It was fantastic. Thank everyone for the questions and thank you for indexing those interviews. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we'll let you know when they're in, in our uh, content system. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. All right. Have a good day, everyone.